seen for us, you know, the mystique of private equity. You know, we, many of us in this room understand venture capital, you know, funding startup companies. Right. And whereas you're buying the Dunkin' Donuts of the world, <laughs> you're buying uh, Ceridian, the big companies. Tell us where, where you fit, uh, what is private equity for the audience? Well, um, private equity, broadly speaking, is a, is a nice name for what we used to call the leverage buyout world or the management buyout world which is fundamentally buying companies that have positive cash flow and using leverage to enhance the returns that you can generate. And if you think about the evolution of private equity, and to some extent, <coughs> venture capital has some significant challenges because you're trying to identify a company that actually will go from almost nothing to incredibly successful. We were trying to identify reasonably good companies. And in the 1980s, you were able to identify good companies and buy them at prices that were relatively low because the sellers didn't recognize the power of the leverage to generate these very high rates of return. So those were the easy days in the industry. And with that success came a recognition uh, that you could make a lot of money by buying something with nine parts debt and one part equity and then using the cash flows of that company to pay off the debt and you turn that one part equity into basically somewhere between half and 100% of the capital structure. You know, by the time it depends on you, you know that. You know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have an LP in your fund, so I'm hoping the returns are going to exactly be Exactly, they're that good. Well, unfortunately, the world has evolved where sellers got uh, a, a lot more knowledgeable. And it required us to do more. And in the private equity world, it meant that we had to become much more proactive at identifying companies that could outperform the general markets that we participate in, uh, that we all participate in, in terms of the public markets, and in that identifying then management teams that can manage those companies in ways that can drive even greater outperformance of those markets. And by driving that outperformance, even if you had to pay a somewhat of a higher price, you were able to generate nice returns, 20 to 35% uh, annual uh, returns. And over time, even that became a little bit more difficult. And if you fast forward to today, the private equity world continues to focus on buying companies that have positive cash flow at some multiple of that cash flow. But you need to do more and more with these companies. And you mentioned Vivek Sharma, for example. At our firm, over the last 10 years, we have found that if we focus on buying companies that we think are pretty good companies, hopefully in industries where you have some wind at your back, and you work with those companies to become great companies, you can continue to drive these reasonably good returns. Could you give us an example and of so a company you bought where you came in with your capital and ideas and, and really sure. transformed it? Yeah, I, and I'll go through a number of companies in different industries very quickly, this sector. But it could be buying a company uh, like Houghton Mifflin in the educational publishing business which was a business that we had looked at for over a decade. And we tried to buy Simon & Schuster and uh, we got beat by a very large corporate in the UK. We tried to buy Harcourt here in, headquartered here in Boston and Reed Elsevier and Thompson beat us. We tried to buy Houghton Mifflin at one point and Vivendi came in and there were no more companies to buy in that industry. And it's an industry that had very attractive elements to it in terms of the nature of the growth in the business and the free cash flow of those businesses. A year later, Vivendi gets in trouble and they need to sell the business and we were able to buy it actually at a more attractive price than we would have offered a year earlier. Um, and what we knew about the industry was there was, there was a, a cyclicality to it that we could capitalize on by investing heavily in the normal down cycles of the industry. And these are cycles having to do with state adoptions of new textbooks. And it was a very easily predictable cycle because states would tell you 10 years in advance when they were going to do these adoptions. And historically, the competitors in this business would stop investing during the down cycle and then invest when they need the up cycle. But coming upon that, we knew that if we invested heavily in the quality of the management team, in the systems in the company, and in the product's quality and breadth, that coming out of that cycle, we potentially could have a significant advantage. And so we were able to, in about a three year period, quadruple our invest, uh, the return on our money, largely by 
looking at this company, thinking about it in a slightly different way than perhaps the conventional wisdom of the industry thought about it. We knew who the best CEO in the business was. He happened to be at uh, Harcourt, having been bought by Reed. We freed him from a non-compete, brought him in, upgraded the management team, and then made the kinds of investments. You're essentially doing re-engineering. So mean, we're re-engineering the company. It's a healthy company. company. It's not a, it is not it a broken, sick company. We buy broken companies, but not on purpose. Okay. So okay. we uh, are trying to buy that good company and make it great. Or you can buy a Warner Music, which we were able to buy. And at the time that we bought it, we had looked at that business also for almost a decade. Like the free cash flow characteristics, like the asset value of the business, it had gone through lots of challenges. It is an example, comment was made earlier that we need to constantly innovate in order to stay ahead. That was an industry that failed to innovate to stay ahead. And so our observation was you needed to readjust the cost structure of these businesses, these enormous global cost structures. You needed to take a new approach to how you develop talent. You needed to take a new approach about how to market that, and you needed to take a new approach about the opportunities that the digital world presented. And so we identified a management team that we thought could do that. They were quickly able to double the EBITDA of the business within the first 12 months that we owned it, and we were able to uh, have a successful investment. Again, the focus on re-engineering the processes, fundamental processes of the business. And we're doing that in companies, again, that we think are good companies, that we can make great companies, to use a trite phrase. And we're doing it in situations where we think we have some wind at our back, hopefully, in the industry. We also do it in situations where it didn't, the wind didn't turn out to be at our back after coming out of it. So Clear Channel is an example of a very large company, a $24 billion company that we acquired in 2008. And we, it's the largest radio and, and outdoor advertising company in the world. And it's a company that has very good free cash flow, uh, has two businesses that generate very high EBITDA margins, even in bad situations. But we anticipated when we bought it in 2008 that we were going to be in a recessionary period. The recession was much worse than we expected. And if you look at what happened with Clear Channel relative to its number two competitor, CBS, we were able to take about $650 million out of the cost structure of that business, 600 of which is on a permanent basis. Benefit, if you can use that word, from the fact that when revenues are down, other costs are down, like commissions, so we were $700 million better off. So if you look at what happened with that advertising recession because of the way we re-engineered the business, and it wasn't just taking costs out, it was adding costs in certain areas. They didn't know how to price their product. And we brought people in from industries like airlines and hotels where they know how to s price a product that disappears after a certain point, like a radio ad does. And, they, and we put a whole layer of people in charge of that. The net result was we were able to take significant market share during the entirety of this period and make it through with, with less hit to our bottom line in, in a significant way than our competitors. So even when the thing, when the, the headwinds are there that we don't anticipate, the ability to look at how you might engineer this company to be a better competitor a more cost-effective competitor to be a better uh, uh, converter of revenue to free cash flow than they had existed before allows them to gain share, to make more money, and over time, because they're gaining share, to accelerate their revenue growth. And that's the objective. And Is that a fair criticism of private equity that, you know, perhaps uh, – you know, uh, a healthy company, you know, a lot of debt is added, and perhaps it makes, in a difficult period, maybe the it hobbles the company, maybe sure. it becomes weaker. I, I would say the, the following, because it, there is no doubt that we add more debt to companies. It is clearly not in our interest as a buyer of those companies to add debt that we think will be a negative for that company. And there are certainly mistakes made and the leverage can exacerbate a situation that becomes problematic. But if you look at the data, and this is the last three years present a great data set, the, the predictions that all these companies were going to fail because of the debt that was layered on them in the 2000, particularly the 2007 time period, turned out not to be true. Now why, why is that? It's because 
we are focused on the kinds of operational and cultural improvements and managerial improvements that I was just talking about as a way to make these companies outperform even with the incremental leverage that they have. In addition, the debt that's being put on these companies isn't, isn't it's not there without value creation. In other words, uh, it's, uh, I'm being inarticulate. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good debt. W well, it's debt that's going to pay somebody a lot of money for buying those companies. And those somebodies are largely public shareholders or corporations that are looking to rationalize their portfolio and can use the capital more efficiently. And so the first thing that the criticisms that you mentioned miss is that they're right off the bat, there are people who are benefiting from the ability of private equity to pay more for companies than they currently may be valued in the public market. The shareholders, yeah. The shareholders. And in fact, all the stakeholders, usually management as well. The second is the private equity industry, I think in general, has gotten pretty good about putting on an amount of debt that allows us to generate the returns we're looking for, but as we've seen in the last three years, not so much as to destroy these companies. And in fact, in combination with the operational improvements that we're driving, allow you to generate significant returns for the management teams and for all of the um, owners of these companies. Our investors, like many venture capital funds, are firemen and teachers and policemen who are the uh, are represented by their public uh, employee retirement systems and teacher uh, retirement systems, um, its foundations, its endowments. And so there is a benefit to being able to drive the kind of profitability the industry has been able to drive for, I think, a broader universe. Absolutely. It's been a great asset class over time. Uh, you know, the returns of private equity have always been, been, been substantially higher. Now, 2008, we saw a huge crisis. You know, uh, the economy came off its wheels and uh, things did not work. And uh, now, as a private equity investor, you know, what, what lessons did you learn? Did that, you know, are you doing things differently but because of 2008? Yeah, I would say the biggest mistake as an industry that we made is, and it's, an, it's a mistake that I would say in different forms we have repeated at least three times in the last 30 years, is allowing our own success at certain things to, it allows us to ignore certain realities that we keep on coming back to. And the first reality is, no matter how smart you think you are, there are limits as to what you can do and what you can do in terms of the price that you pay for companies. The key mistake that we often make as an industry is to allow the capital markets to drive the valuations we put on companies as opposed to looking at the intrinsic value of that company as the real metric for what you're willing to pay for it. And if you look at 2007, 2008, where we had wonderful credit markets that, were pro that was providing debt levels that had been unheard of. So seven, eight, nine, even 10 times EBITDA levels of debt for companies and industries that historically had traded as an entire enterprise value at no more than seven, eight, or nine times. You were able to make the numbers work because you were getting so much cheap debt and you were paying 11 or 12 times in many cases. I mean, there were a number of retail deals done at 11, 12, 13 times EBITDA when the industry itself had generally traded at seven to nine times. The numbers worked on the model because you were able to use all this relatively inexpensive debt. The net result of that was a tr major transference of value from the buyer to the seller. Aren't you and saying that again now that interest rates being so low. Well, this is, this is the interesting thing I would observe. Right now, we find it impossible to buy plain vanilla transactions. Unlike the uh, recessions in 82, in 87, in 91, in 2001, where we had extended periods where you could buy companies at prices that were significantly lower than average, we never saw that this time. And we've now gone into a period where pricing for plain vanilla transactions is actually reasonably frothy. 
<coughs> and part of it is driven by very strong credit markets again. High yield is high yield is instance. better than it's ever been. It was better than it was in 07, and the bank is re bank markets returning to that, the loan market. But the positive is you haven't seen a lot of deals happen, and you've seen more companies that have announced they want to do something where they've then had to announce they didn't get bids that were sufficient, which is a hopeful sign that we did learn something from 08, that we're not going to let a major transference of value go from the buyer to the seller because the credit markets allow so that to happen. So basically say no. If basically you, if you say no. don't find the deal, Look stay, for, stay in cash. We, we, we have done a, a series of transactions that I would say are much more complicated, much more off the beaten path, right. oftentimes much smaller as a platform than we ever would have done in the last seven or eight years. And that's where you have to go in order to drive value today. That's sort of a natural question for you. You know, all of us, you know, live here, this is our home. And the constant refrain you hear in the media is the United States is in decline. The dollar is under, certainly under pressure that, you know, we're gonna be taken over by, by other countries. And from your vantage point, you invest in the United States, by and large. Um, how do you see this country, uh, you know, the next 10 years and the next 20 years? And what do you think? What is your, are you bullish on the prospects? Are you bearish? What's your sense? I, I would have to say I remain very hopeful long term. Um, I do think that when you look at the robustness of our economy, even in a very difficult time, um, there is hope that we can continue to innovate, that we can continue to build upon one of the highest GDP per capita in the world, not just gross GDP, um, and that we can do the sorts of things I'm talking about to a broad range of companies in much the same way that the entrepreneurial, the venture-backed entrepreneurial world is creating new industries and new ways of thinking about things that add to the vibrancy of our economy here. Clearly, we face enormous near-term challenges. And you know, I do hope that we end up with a debate that is not just between one, part of the, uh, one party that's suggesting that government ought to be 23 to 25% of GDP and another party that is just talking about the world falling apart and how we need to make just deal with a deficit problem that needs to be dealt with as opposed to talking about how do we achieve a level of growth that if you look at history has always been our solution to debt issues. So if you look at the data, a 1% swing in GDP has a, over 10 years has a three to $4 trillion impact on our deficit situation, which dwarfs anything either party's talking about from either tax increases or other types of cuts. It just reminds you that what this country has always been about has been a level of optimism, a level of entrepreneurialism that has generated a reasonable level of growth, even on a very large base. We're not going to achieve the growth that you have that exists in India, that exists in China or Brazil, but we ought to be focused on getting back to a place where we have sufficient growth to help deal with the deficit problem, but also create the jobs that are necessary to keep this country uh, in a leadership position.